Welcome to Positive Filter with your host, Fuller Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help along the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and people. It's Phil Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. I'm joined by a special guest. Well, everyone's a special guest because they take time to join me on my podcast. I'm joined by Jazz Hill. Now, as you know, some people I know, some people I don't. Some people I meet for the first time on this podcast. And Jazz is one of those people that this is the first time that we're meeting, but it won't be the last time that we communicate and stay in touch with each other. But uh, I looked at her her history and she has such a breadth of uh, knowledge of industry knowledge of being in Hollywood or LA and working in modeling. So I was like, wow, this could be a great conversation, particularly for young people that are trying to break into the industry of modeling and promoting themselves. So I think this will be a great episode. So Jazz, can you give the listeners a little bit of a background on who you are before we you know, start this podcast? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for talking with me today and um, having me here to have this conversation with you. Um, to start off, um, I'm from Calabasas, California. I'm 23 years old. I just graduated college last this past December, actually, from Long Beach State University. Um, my major was communications and public affairs. Currently, I'm trying to go after my master's. I'm in the process of applications right now. So fingers crossed to see where I end up. Hopefully it's a good school. Um, but as far as the entertainment business, um, as far as modeling, I do print and commercials. That's where I get most of my bank per se. And um, aside from the modeling, I am also involved in publicist work as well as the publicist firm that I work with currently is also opening a production division, which I'm becoming very hands-on with as far as pitching and selling television shows, films, um, reading scripts, writing scripts, really moving into potentially this new producer role. And hopefully sometime in the next couple of years, I'll be able to um, sign a deal with a, with a studio lot for this production company. Wow, that's quite uh, uh, a lot of things going on. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so you grew up in, in, in California, and I guess, uh, you know, was this like something you were already familiar with, this world of entertainment and modeling growing up, uh, you know, in high school, did, you know, did, or family members? Was this like something that you knew of or did you learned this later in life? So this was something that was always around me already. Um, Both of my parents are actually private fitness trainers. They have a gym in West Hollywood, but more specifically, their clientele, um, for me to watch them growing up, they worked with everyone in the entertainment business. I mean, actors, CEOs of you know, I'm talking Sony, Universal Studios. Um, I was constantly around these people and um, just for sure always in that atmosphere. And um, it was definitely something I was able to watch. On top of that, you know, going to a high school like Calabasas High School, for example. And when you think Calabasas, a lot of people reference, oh, that's where the Kardashians lives, where Drake lives. Some people call it the home of the stars, yada, yada, yada. Um, also growing up in an atmosphere as that. And when you go to that school, there are other people in entertainment, whether it's sports, whether it's television that, you know, their kids went to school with me as well. And I literally, literally grew up walking to school every day, walking through a parking lot of Mercedes-Benz, BMWs, G-Wagons driven by 16-year-olds. And that was something that was also a major part of my upbringing that was around me. Wasn't ever something I had personally. I didn't grow up with, you know, money and stuff, but it was the 
uber wealth that I was constantly seeing and understanding where it was coming from. What was the majority of these people's careers that was able to put their children in this position to have these nice cars or to grow up in this affluent community. And, you know, so it's a very, this community here in Los Angeles, um, is, is extremely entertainment business oriented, of course. Um, and Hollywood being here based out of here as well. It's what I was constantly seeing, constantly seeing all the time. I, I, I find that, you know, so interesting. And then, you know, like particularly your upbringing and that high school environment of the uber rich. And, uh, you know, my high school was very diverse where it was very polarizing. Like we did have where I live in Northern Virginia, we had the, top 1% of wealth, but then we also had those that lived in subsidized housing in one school. So we had a very polarizing experience. Was yours very polarizing or was mostly this, mostly wealth? It was mostly, it was mostly wealth for sure. I mean, if anything, it was definitely flipped where that 1% that was not extremely wealthy was actually the kids that were recruited for the sports teams for our football team for the volleyball team the track team that was our one percent um and that is also during the time that i went to calabasas that was definitely the time period where calabasas was blowing up a little bit because all our sports teams were doing extremely well um but again, that was literally because we were bringing in so many of these star athletes that were not from that community. Um, that 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 was the only flip side to that. So literally opposite of what you just said. Oh, interesting. And so, as you transfer, you came um, as you know a little bit about your journey. You came to the East Coast for one year, um, and then we we could just fast forward over that and go back when you return home, when did you start thinking returning home to start working and start getting yourself out there in regards to your own career as a model? So um, when I first started off in college, after I graduated, um, as I was saying before we actually started this episode, I used to play volleyball. It was a huge part of my life. I was playing for over 10 and a half years. Um, I ended up making it to college, playing on the East Coast um, at Catholic University in the Big East Conference, very briefly before I decided to transfer back home for multiple reasons, issues with the university I was playing at. When I transferred back home, it was around 2019. It was right before the pandemic happened, right before, literally. Um, I was in a weird place. I was in a really weird place and thinking, well, I'm not really sure if I want to continue this path of volleyball. Something kind of catapulted to me because the thing about a sport like volleyball is it's not like football or basketball where you can make this career out of it. There's a league for it and it pays the numbers that these other sports do. It's not really the same. And I didn't have as strong as much of a, a push or a drive for it anymore as I did prior. The only goal with that sport for me was just to get me to college. And that's exactly what it did. But now that I realized, well, this isn't now that this isn't something that I necessarily need anymore. In fact, I'm very smart enough to put myself through school without the need of like, do I need to put my energy into something as this when I've always had these other interests that I really need to start practicing with repetition a little bit more now and taking more seriously? I think I'm going to go to option B. And um, yeah, 2019, I moved back home. I was in a position where I, I also had to figure myself out, you know, I needed to figure out like this was a time when I didn't have a car. I was briefly back home. I had no money. And this was a very like low point for me. This was not something that I wanted to be in. This was like, I need to elevate myself to some degree in some way and get myself out of this very quickly. Um, Cause I am not this person to just sit around and just, you know, 
wait for something to happen or, you know, whatever. I, it was a moment of push for me and sort of just a F it moment of like, just, just do it. Just go after what is it that you always wanted to do in the first place. Um, and plus growing up anyways, I was always involved in theater and choir because I also sing and, and dance. I was always taking those classes. I was always, um, always had that on the side, aside from my constant training with this sport being pushed by my father who also played basketball. Um, so this transition immediately took off and since that time, um, it was really the pandemic that really pushed it. For some reason, even though a lot of people weren't working, I was really working. Like really, for some reason, this was my time to come up. And that was when I just immediately, everything started happening. I, I transferred into my amazing new four year. I got my apartment, I got my car. This modeling progression became full time. I ended up signing to my first agency, then my second agency. Then I started learning the game about how to be signing to agencies. Could I sign a multiple? How do I need to get myself more exposure for getting booked? I really started learning the game. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't anybody teaching me that. That's something people got to understand is I think they look to somebody really to teach them or tell them when the best teacher is yourself. And it's you putting yourself in these circumstances, positions, whether it's like you putting yourself in the exposure of going to a set or putting yourself out there getting booked for a set, you are putting yourself there to learn, but only you can take in, you know, whatever it is that, um, you're going out there for. So, um, yeah, it's it's been some major transition for me since that time period. I'm very curious, though. I mean, you're saying the, the experience is the greatest teacher. Putting yourself out there is a great teacher. But at the same time, you know, obviously, we don't always get there on our own, whether we have a mentor or someone we looked up to to kind of show us the path or read books. Mm -hmm. So in that part, right, teaching yourself the game of modeling and putting yourself out there, I, I, I hear that you said you use experience to teach you this, but was there also any other concrete, tangible learning tools that you use, whether it was a person that guided a mentor or books or podcasts that you listen to, any, anything like that? Honestly, and, and I'm going to be real, everything you just said, as far as these, these tools, though, whether it was books, whether it was classes such as like acting classes I have been taking um these are still these are still tools that I had to put myself out there to find yeah, okay. that I had to enroll myself in in order to meet that teacher and don't get me wrong I have worked with teachers to help me in front of camera work um runway coaches um mm -hmm. you know even even my agents my management that I have now that also work in that field of really training their um their people who they have signed under them these are still people that I had to give the okay to of like, I'm going to work with you. I want to work with you because of A, B, and C, because this is my goal as to, I need to get here. But it always, and only comes down to solely yourself <clears throat> as far as, um, you know, meeting that person and taking that meeting. And like you said, reading that book, taking the class, you know, whatever the case is like, it still always came down to my research on it and finding these tools. I love that. So finding, I love that research and doing it. So it's basically, you had to put yourself out there. Um, when you were in that funky, funky space, you know, like moving in, moving into the pandemic, did you like say, okay, enough is enough. I'm going to start hitting it. And like, did you map this out? You know, like, you know, was it, was this happenstance or are you like, okay, I, I I I I feel like I'm attractive. I feel like I'm tall. I feel like I I can sing. I can dance. I'm going to be a model and actress. Did did, did you like a light bulb go off, or you just kind of started adding these things together? Like I everything might... really started. 
everything the last couple of years has been coming together very slowly. I started off with the modeling only because mm-hmm. I needed it to help me get comfortable in front of a camera. Yeah. It was training to get me in the transitioning of learning and working towards acting. Then as far as, you know, now now currently working through and training for like auditions for acting that I get now, then I start thinking bigger scope. Well, if this is what I can do in front of the camera, what is it I can create behind the camera? And that's when I started getting in the mindset of, well, what could I be as a producer? That's where I'm thinking with this company I'm working with now that's opening up a production division, um, really getting my hands on reading scripts and thinking about writing scripts and thinking, well, what if I could create a project or write a project that I could pitch, that I could put myself in? And you think and you see all of these, um, you know, very successful actresses now, actually, if you if you read into them, Margot Robbie, Gal Gadot, um, a lot of these actresses, they have their own production companies. Reese Witherspoon, they have all these production companies. And it's solely because, I mean, not only is it making them more money, but these women are writing themselves into roles because that's also, that's that, not just the drive that they have, but they're thinking smart creatively as far as like, how else can they get themselves a job to be put on a screen? It's not, it's not always going to be a studio or whatever the case is that's going to pick you for every role. Sometimes you literally have to make your own role, which has made me already think and transition into, okay, I should start working on this as well. Because if I were to write a project and I sell it successfully, oh, like then then that's all mine. That's, I know what I'm doing, you know, so. So I'm very curious. I mean, like, I think that's great because you're taking the agency in your own hands, right? And you're taking mm-hmm. the power and saying, like, you know, I'm not going to wait for other people to create opportunities. If I become a producer, I create my own opportunities. But and I said, there's not but. But also, what I'm hearing concurrently is that you might be going back to school yourself to get a master's. So in that, to in those in that thought process of that trajectory, that what you want to do for your career, you know, t- discuss with us a little bit about. Your thoughts about like, you know, this is going to take a lot of work, but also currently you're going to be also doing something else to take a lot of work. Do you think they're in conflict or they're going to work together, you know, going to school and this pursuit of entertainment concurrently? Right. Well, so going after my master's, I've constantly, I keep getting told, you know, um, you don't need to go after it right now. You have so much time. You can go back in a few years. I've had people tell me it's not really worth it. Not many people I know even need a master's anymore. Da, 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 da. Um, for myself, I want this master's because I feel as a woman, especially a woman of color in this generation, I find it it's much harder to walk into rooms and be respected unless you have all your badges. And I feel that if I were to walk in and state and show and prove, like, listen, I've, it, it doesn't hurt to have these degrees. It doesn't hurt to say, you know, this is my knowledge. This is my understanding. This is, I went to school for this, for this point of not just to prove to other people, um, just exactly what I'm capable of. But, um, you know, I, I, I want that accomplishment. And also I, I don't find it, I don't find it as a struggle for me or juggling as far as me wanting to do the masters and working on this production division and working on the modeling and working on the acting. Yeah. That sounds like a lot, but I'm good at juggling. Not all people are, I'm not to say that a lot of people are, but Um, it's never something I've ever minded. Um, and good practice for me was during getting my bachelor's, um, while I was in school, completing my four year, the first half of college playing volleyball to transitioning into the modeling and also, you know, like any other work I was doing. I mean, I feel like 
I was already practicing that while completing my four year. I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference as far as getting my master's. I'm just leveling up. That's all I'm pushing myself to doing is just leveling up. I love that. So, you know, you, you spoke about um, being a person of color. Um, uh, and, you know, let's discuss that. How has that been uh, a part of your journey? How has that, you know, created barriers or adversities that you, you know, had to overcome, uh, particularly with the modeling and, and, and the goals of all of the like. So can you talk about those, how that identity has, you know, been a part of your journey so far? Mm. I will say, um, the entertainment business can be messed up. <laughs> it can be really messed up. The first manager I ever worked with who I signed with, um, did not get me much work. I didn't really enjoy working with her. There's, I, some about her energy. I was like, mm, this isn't going to work for me. One of the first things she said to me as far as my look and what I needed to do when I first came to her, um, I had really bad acne prone skin and I had dyed my hair blonde. Um, she first told me she wasn't going to sign me until I would clean up my skin and dye my hair brown to look more like I was basically mixed, like to quote unquote, not confuse middle America. That's what she said. Keep in mind, this manager is a white lady. Um, I came back, you know, I did everything she had asked as far as like giving her, delivering this look she wanted as far as sending me out for roles, for jobs. And I just remember her saying to me one day, before saying that she was gonna work with me, you know, she said black girls are just in right now. And the way she said it so subtle to me, so like just no shame in it, no, like it's the truth. Not to say it wasn't, but the delivery from her, I thought that's crazy. That's crazy. And to also think in her head, the only reason she's taking me on as as her client, as someone to, yeah. to send out is to help make her money. She's only seeing me as this product, rather a person. She's only seeing me as as this individual who, oh, like she she checks off the boxes for African American, you know, mixed ethnically ambiguous, whatever for this role. And without really understanding, you know, what what type of family does she come from? What type of background does she come from? What's, you know, wh what is she about? What are her morals? Like not really asking any of those questions because she don't really, she don't really care about that. She's really caring about, okay, you fit the look. Let's put you here, which a lot of representation is like that. That's how people even get signed to agencies and stuff in the first place. They're looking for a certain look, whether it's to check off, you know, how how could you be in the category of our plus size division? How could you be in the category of our ethnic division? How could you be in the category of our LGBTQ division? Like we, this this industry is a lot surrounded by checking off boxes. Can you check off boxes and which one? Or can you fill this slot on this roster? If you can, yeah. That, sure, now you're signed. Congratulations. But that's only if that slot opens up. So it, it's uh, dealing with things like that um, have been crazy, especially getting booked on sets where I'm not kidding. Like there have been countless sets. Almost every set I've been on has been an all white crew. I think I've only ever worked on a commercial once with a guy there was one man on set who was black and he was a part of the the lighting uh crew or something but i think that was the only person i'd ever worked with um as far as what's going on behind the camera but makeup artist hairstylist never worked with a black and white hairstylist but they're hiring people of color they want people of color of ethnic uh you know, looks on screen, 
but how it's handled off screen is like, you know, find somebody that's going to understand how to do my hair, you know, like to actually properly work with curly hair to make it not frizzy, but, you know, do something correct with it. So these things, these unacknowledged um, situations, scenarios in this business are real. They're totally ignored. They are totally sw um, swept under the rug and looked at as, oh, it's just whatever. But um, it's not. <laughs> it's really, it's really, really not. It's really, uh, it, it does make you question these, uh, these huge, huge companies. Who are these people running them? Because uh, I'll tell you something, it's not too many it's not too many people of color. For sure not. It's for sure not. I mean, it's very systemic. And I, you see me grimacing and just like, wow, sounds very toxic. Mm. And, and like some like kind of like racial, like PTSD, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like racial trauma, like mm. my, those microaggressions, those words, like they, I can, I can empathize with that where they say, oh, you're in right now. I'm like, wow, they're not seeing me as a person or. Right. They saying things like, you know, you're smart for a black guy, you know, things like right, that. Right. These little words that like, what do you, what do you mean by that? Or like, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that someone said, oh, you're you're beautiful for a black woman. You know, like, right. like, what do you, what right. do you mean by that? You know, and, right. Um, right. It seems very hard, but I don't know. I don't even think I have a question. I was just like, when I was listening to your story, it just it sounded just like toxic, right? Oh yeah. But oh, yeah. shining a light, what? You know, what, you know, as you go through these efforts, you know, which ways, you know, do you want young people coming up after you, you know, to hopefully, what do you see to make this industry better? Or, uh, you know, you said, you said a, a few things, right? Like leadership roles of people of color with leadership roles. What, what, what would, you know, make this, you know, system better, you know, you know, for, for black creators and models and actors and actresses and models and all those things. So this idea of people now saying like, there's no need for a degree, no need for going to school or, or getting into debt. I understand that. Um, but I disagree with the notion of being educated on these matters. I think that's, I think everyone um, needs to be a lot, my generation specifically needs to be a lot more aware and alert of of what's happening in the world right now. There are so many things. We're touching on a speck of the whole realm of issues that is happening currently. I mean, it, it, we're just talking about racial matters, haven't even begun to look into what's going on with the climate crisis, what's happening with elections next year. It's next year, it's coming back. I mean, like, you know, it, it's, there's so many, there are really so many concerns that people, just don't really, they're just not aware of. They're just not aware of. And then, you know, we pay more attention to, um, I don't know if, if vulgarity is actually a word, but just more vulgar things that we see online, right? Or on social media, we pay more attention to that. And that's more trending because, because of how inappropriate it is. And it, and it tears away and takes away from just these these matters that we're talking about right now as far as what we really should be focusing on and figuring out and understanding and paying attention to um, because there will be no change unless somebody goes in and faces it and is like, oh, like I, I see this for what it is now. Somebody does need to take action in this, you know? There's not enough... Um, there's, ju there's just not enough awareness or education, I think, for my generation to understand um, so many of these issues that are happening today in our generation, I think. So one thing I was thinking about is that if you were to do your own movie, this is random, your own movie or own TV show, what would it be about? 
I've written multiple, um, multiple storyline ideas already. <laughs> I've written multiple. It's just a matter of the way I, I've written these stories already. And I know I'm already 23, um, only 23. It's not like I'm like in my forties or fifties or something, but I learned that how I write, um, is based on different times and points and experiences in my life, different periods. So if I were to, if you were, if you're sitting here and you're asking me, you know, like what's the one story, I don't think I could even give you just one story. I think that it would honestly be a collective of, of multiple and more to come, I believe, because I am, I do feel as this storyteller, as the story creator, that I'm going to have so many more insightful things to share to people, I think, the older I get. Um, and, and the stories I have written now, as far as just how I grew up and what I'm seeing and what I'm aware of around me and what I think should change. Now it's me thinking, well, how can I change them or how could I be that person to provoke change? That goes into the next story, though. Excellent. Well, that was that was so you almost mic drop. So we're gonna be at the part of my show called Shot for Shot. Uh, you get to ask me any random question. I get to ask you any random question. You wanna go first? I'll go first. Um. Okay. I'll go first. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> okay. Um. How old are you? Forty. So really? I'm no, I'm thirty-eight. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna claim forty. I'm thirty-eight. Uh, two more years, then I'm I'm washed, and now I'm 40. So I laughed a little bit wow. when you're like, I got all these stories, but I'm now 50 or 40. I'm like, ah, oh, I'm almost oh, there. Wow. I'm almost there. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, your turn. That's it. That was the random question. Just how old I am. I thought we're bouncing back and forth. No. Oh, okay, I thought you was gonna hit me with like a meta question. Hit me. No. With, like, I thought it was going like a, a deeper question, and rather than just shot for shot, like uh, we oh, start small. We start small. Okay. Okay. Here, and then we'll do we'll do two then. All right. So you had an experience on the East Coast and West Coast. Mm -hmm. I, I love asking these people, is there a different vibe? And what are the differences between your experience in the DMV area and LA? Mm. And I know you was only a freshman, but still, you probably still could absorb and such, see. You. Yeah, yeah. Um, such a difference, such a total difference. East Coast people. I, I loved the East Coast, let me just say. At some point in my life, I would love to move back to the East Coast. Um, the the culture, the 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 energy there, I, I fell in love with, especially living in Washington, D.C. Um, I definitely noticed, like when I was going to my school, when I was going to Catholic, um, I was the only mixed student on campus actually like out of like everybody there was nobody else and then there was this less than three to five percent of african-american students and then everybody else was white obviously we know dc is they they reference washington dc as chocolate city because mm -hmm. there are a lot of black people there but the school i went to um alone i was the only mixed person there now going out during, you know, the weekends or whatever, let's say, um, if I was going to Georgetown partying, if I was at UMD, if I was at Howard, um, it was sort of the same thing. I realized a lot of people, for some reason, when I went to school out there could recognize that I not only was it from there, um, they just some, I don't know, a lot of people somehow immediately picked up. I was already like a West Coast girl, but it, it was very, um, it was almost like I was the culture shock for some reason that walked into the room. And I actually realized that, and, and I think this is, I think this is true, but there's a lot more um, mixed culture, mixed, uh, less restrained um, individuals who are on the West Coast, especially LA, you're seeing all different types of people, all different types of um, 
ethnicities from everywhere. And that's a normal thing for LA. You go somewhere like the East Coast or, or of course, even like Midwest, anywhere else in the country, basically, you don't actually have that. Melting um, pot. Yeah, you don't have as much of that melting pot. Exactly. And I did sort of pick up on that in DC. It wasn't really as much of that melting pot. It was very just this way or that way. Wasn't too much in between like Callie is. So uh, that option. was definitely something I um, I took note of. It wasn't as much of a melting pot. I bet New York is probably a little different, but I could see that in the DMV or DC. So yeah, valid. But yeah. Interesting point. All right, what's your second? Your 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 the full question rather than just if I'm 40 and washed, I'm 38 <laughs> or 38 and washed. What's your question for me? Um, you said you created this podcast for enjoyment. What is this enjoyment that you seek out of bringing other guests onto your show and having them express their stories and experiences with you? Excellent. Well, that's a great question. Yeah. I mean, honestly, uh, my podcast is, um, I, you know, not a moneymaker, you know, I have not monetized it but so for me these podcast recordings not only are ways that i can elevate the voices of others you know my friends or you as a guest can you know elevate your voice by connecting with new audiences but as you can see, you can tell i was taking notes and when i say i take notes i'm learning like for me honestly this is like one large archive of interviews that maybe one day i can you know listen to and learn about the different nuances of industries. Like I asked, you know, I learned a little bit about your, the industries of modeling and PR. Um, I've had other guests in different industries. So for me, this has been like just one large learning project. You know, like not only do I get to practice public speaking myself, I wanted to become a more confident public speaker. So I use podcasting to do that. But like you said, I get to learn from people's stories. And usually that's honestly, when I was always growing up, I was all always an audio listener, you know, audio learner that I learned through pod. I learned through listening to podcasts of other people, you know, uh, and their story. So for me, this has been just a great way to tap into, you know, humans and learn from them and learn new things that I never would have thought of. Right. Like you're my first, I think, person to talk about modeling. Right. So like, yeah. So I get to learn now I had that, you know, and I'm very curious. Now you're going to have me do an experiment, like go back through my old, I have over 300 podcasts and wow. see the different industries that people work in. Cause I never thought about that. Like, you know, lawyers, I had lawyers and doctors and higher ed professionals, all these different people. So I, I guess, yeah, it's kind of like a career thing too. Like I'm learning about different careers. Yeah. Yes. Seriously. All right. Well, this has been great. Um, you know, and I think that we took a lot of value out of this and I'm definitely excited to share this with the listeners. This is the part of the show. It's called shout outs and plugs. So you get to show love, shout out anyone you want to show love to. And then plugs. These are things that you want the listeners to be aware of things that you're working on or ways that they can follow up or get engaged with you. So you're, you're, you're on shout outs and plugs. Um, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> shout out to, um, I'll just make one shout out to my mom, actually, not in a typical way at all, but I feel that we have really been inspiring each other this past year. And she's also a writer and she's really trying to break into the entertainment business as well and writing projects. And we've been on the same page as that and supporting each other and really pushing each other. So shout out to her for just being so strong and being so driven and really teaching me these things because I take after her and um, I love her so much. Shout out to you, mom. And then plugs, what are the things that you're working on and ways that uh, the listeners of this can stay, you know, up to date with what you're doing? I'll put some of that information in the show notes. Yeah. So currently, yeah, man, I'm still listening and working on, um, still just the modeling still trying to get booked and busy um hopefully i will book a role at some point maybe with a show maybe with a movie fingers crossed everybody hopefully 
you remember who I am. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully um, this production company that I'm working with, we get to sell a few shows and I really get to move into this producer role. And um, and this goes well that I, I sign a deal with somebody. I'm, I'm hoping these things move forward positively. And then how can they... Uh, listeners stay engaged with you um to keep up with me you can follow me on instagram at i am jazz j-a-z-z hill h-i-l-l i also have a tiktok i haven't really been posting on there though because i hear that they are going to shut down tiktok i'm not really sure but if you want to check me out on tiktok it's and all that jazz with five z's and all that jazz yeah all right excellent well this has been a great show uh, thank you so much, Jazz, for being a guest on this show. And thank you uh, for sharing your journey with us. You know, Positive Filter listeners, if you're listening to this episode, please share it. Uh, give this uh, podcast a review or rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. That helps elevate it. Um, as you know, every episode is dedicated to the memory of my late father-in-law, Jeff Kirsch. So please consider contributing to the Jeff Kirsch Anti-Hunger Fund that is in the show notes. Um, to, a way to honor him and his uh, his legacy. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting. Keep being positive, and we're out. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends, and like the Facebook page, spreading positivity and movement. Thanks for listening. <laughs>